I... I had an epiphany. <laughs> you should have ruled this planet. You were stronger. Smarter. But then they came. Those inferior dullards. They came and took this planet away from you. I am with you now. Welcome back to Final Fantasy The Psychology and Philosophy. Today we're going to be looking at some crazy gentlemen and ladies. This episode is all about the villains and monsters of the FF franchise, which is filled with a bunch of insane stuff. The heroes in FF clash against just about every kind of demon, monster, madman, scoundrel, and anti-hero I can think of. Whether they're waging war against the incarnation of all dreams, taking apart armed processor cores, or defending themselves against leafers, they're usually fighting to survive every day of their lives. But this episode isn't really about them. No. Instead, it's about these guys. I'm going to try and list all the types of things FF heroes typically have problems with. We have fiends and monsters, notorious monsters, mechanical and or magical abominations, empire soldiers, tragic anti-heroes, corrupt politicians, bureaucrats, and public figures, scientists from hell, despots, super soldiers that nobody is able to control, Demons and Archfiends, Incarnated Angels of Death, Meddlesome Otherworldly Invaders, and finally, whatever the heck these things are. In this episode, I will attempt to explain the origins, hierarchies, and relationships between these things. Although the player is spending most of the game fighting hordes of pesky monsters, the story tends to focus more on the humanoid villains. In particular, a villainous empire, corporation, or organization is usually at the heart of the plot. These empires are often causing disasters on a global scale, starting wars, creating aforementioned abominations, destroying the environment, laying waste to villages, capturing, brainwashing, enslaving, transforming, annexing, and frowning at whomever they please, and that's on a good day. Many of these warlords and corporate tools even kill their own comrades when they feel like it. The main antagonist always takes part in these atrocities, whether or not he is the initial instigator, and it is usually through the use of his powers and connections that they are able to destroy their targets and pillage their neighbors so efficiently. However, the main antagonists rarely cooperate with the other villains for long, since their aspirations are usually incompatible with those of everyone else on the planet. Usually, while the evil empire wishes merely to own the world, the main antagonist wishes to transform it into something truly terrifying. There is really only one major story in Final Fantasy. I've already hashed out most of the main plot that happens in the majority of FF titles, so I'll keep this brief. An ancient forbidden power of mysterious origin has been unleashed and or harnessed, or will be harnessed soon. Greedy and hateful individuals strive to maintain and control this force, but fail to realize that it has been appropriated by an ambitious, magical fate defier, whose agenda is synchronous with that of an unimaginably powerful, disembodied, primordial force of will. Invariably, the main antagonist is, at least for a time, a puppet of, merged with, possessed by, or otherwise a lesser incarnation of this fate defier. But the primordial entity uses the main antagonist to further its own agenda, ultimately discarding the fate defier in favor of his even more powerful protege. Let's take a closer look at some of these puppets, as well as their bestest frenemies. Golbez is a powerful warlord who spends much of the game gathering magical crystals for the purpose of warfare. His mother was human and his father was a Lunarian from the moon. Throughout the plot, he recruits, engineers, tempts, abducts, possesses, or otherwise manipulates many personages in positions of power, influence, and scientific and magical usefulness, including King Baron, Baron's strongest and most beloved military leaders, Cecil Kane and Bagan, the engineer Sid, the psychopathic genius scientist Dr. Luge, and an assemblage of demons, archdemons, and biddable monster rabbits. He uses his various puppets and captives for waging war, developing battle robots, experimenting with human genetics in order to make stronger, more aggressive armies 
while otherwise being a general dick with a creepy detachable arm. While in cahoots with Baron, he endeavours to squash and subjugate inconvenient races with strong armies and or magical and useful resources. Though near the beginning of the game, the player is led to believe that King Baron is the person with the greatest ambitions and influence, they soon discover that Golbez is willing to take things much further. About midway through the plot, the heroes learn that Golbez is trying to use the crystals to fully activate the partially dismantled weapons systems of the Tower of Babel, which, as it turns out, awakens an ancient mech suit with magic nukes capable of leveling cities, but this is merely a stepping stone on the way to his ultimate goal. It would seem that King Baron and Golbez's interest in the crystals was only a piece of a much larger puzzle. Golbez's true interest had everything to do with the many secrets hidden within the Tower of Babel, whose base rests deep within the underworld and whose peak reaches toward the heavens. We're left to assume that Babel is a fortress built either by the Lunarians during a previous era in anticipation of war, or by some unnamed tertiary culture in Earth's past. It's hinted at that some of the Lunarians once wanted to colonize Earth and wipe out the humans in the process. It is reasonable to assume that Golbez wished not to destroy the Earth, but to conquer it, at least at first. But eventually, it's revealed that what he desired most was an unimaginable power located on the moon. Even though the Lunarians ultimately decided that their devices were more trouble than they were worth and sealed them away, by utilizing their power, Golbez continues the ancient war. That being said, later on it's discovered that Golbez has, in fact, been subject to a mystical form of mind control administered by his disembodied Lunarian handler Zemus, whose body was imprisoned in stasis long ago for warmongering, and because the rest of them also needed to be in stasis for a number of reasons and they couldn't have him running amok. The player also finds out that the Lunarians once had an advanced, wondrous culture, but their own weapons and hatred had essentially destroyed their planet, which is what the Visitable Moon essentially is. Though Golbez manages to break free of Zemus's will before the end, said will, it seems, is still going strong. Underneath the last vestige of the Lunarian world, a giant crystalline palace, is an impenetrable stronghold, which serves as a prison for Zemus, along with his deadliest servants and or creations, the most powerful weapons and equipments once built by the Lunarians, and the sleeping souls and or bodies of the rest of the Lunarian people. Zemus manages to get free of his bonds, but he is killed by Golbez and another Lunarian, Fusoya, soon after. However, it turns out that Zemus, in his way, was no less a puppet than Golbez. At the end of FF4, it is revealed that upon his death, Zemus' soul has awakened something described as being the wellspring of darkness, and merged with it to become Zeromus, who exists as something akin to a god of hatred, and was seemingly behind it all the entire time. When the player defeats Zeromus, he claims that he will always exist as long as there is darkness in the hearts of men. Kefka is a powerful warlord who spends much of the game acquiring magicite crystals for the purpose of warfare. He is a super soldier experiment gone horribly wrong, infused with the DNA of otherworldly beings. But deplorable experiments conducted on him under the authority of Gestal's empire were carried out by the misguided genius scientist Dr. Sid. Though Kefka starts out as a promising and impressively strong soldier, his superiors quickly lose control of him. He goes along with the wishes of Emperor Gestel for a time, but only for as long as it aids his actual agenda. Throughout the plot, he manipulates, enslaves, brainwashes, and murders many personages in positions of power, influence, and scientific and magical usefulness, including Emperor Gestalt, Gestalt's strongest and most beloved military leaders, Celez and Neo, the protagonist, and Dr. Sid. He uses his various puppets and captives for waging war, developing battle robots, and experimenting with human genetics in order to make stronger, more aggressive armies while otherwise being a general dick with a serious need of anger management. While in cahoots with Gestol, he endeavors to squash and subjugate inconvenient races with strong armies and or magic and useful resources. Though near the beginning of the game, the player is led to believe that Emperor Gestol is the person with the greatest ambitions and influence, they soon discover that Kefka is willing to take things much further. About a third of the way into the plot, we learned that the greed of the Empire is enabling Kefka to conduct research on Esper's magicite and highly destructive spells capable of leveling cities. But this is merely a stepping stone on the way to his ultimate goal. It would seem that Gestol and Kefka's interest in the War of Magi, Esper's and Magicite, was only a piece of a much larger puzzle. 
Kafka's true interest had everything to do with the many secrets hidden within the cave to the sealed gate, where he absorbs the powers contained within the statue remains of the warring triad, celestial beings whose wars and power struggles resulted in the presence of magic and espers on Earth, in order to gain the full range of their abilities. Even though the warring triad ultimately decided that their powers were more trouble than they were worth and sealed themselves away, by utilizing their power, Kafka continues the ancient war. After this, Kefka merges his being collectively with theirs, becoming a single god governing all magic and effortlessly erecting a massive living tower of which the Warring Triad are appendages, along with several other unnamed magical effigies. After the player fights their way to the top of the tower, Kefka descends upon them as something akin to a dark angel, and discloses his intentions to destroy all life. During the battle, he says to the party, The end comes, beyond chaos, and then laughs maniacally even though he is losing. Sephiroth is a powerful warlord who spends much of the game tracking down a magical materia crystal for the purpose of warfare. He is a super soldier experiment gone horribly wrong, infused with the DNA of an otherworldly being called Genova, whom the military falsely believed to be one of the Cetra, an ancient humanoid race who were considered the caretakers of the planet. But deplorable experiments conducted on him under the Umbrella Corporation Shinra were carried out by the psychopathic genius scientist Professor Hojo. Though he starts out as a promising and impressively strong soldier, his superiors quickly lose control of him. He goes along with the wishes of President Shinra for a time, but only for as long as it aids his actual agenda. Throughout the plot, he murders, assimilates, possesses, impersonates, or otherwise manipulates many personages in positions of political and social influence, including President Shinra, some of Shinra's strongest and most beloved military leaders, Cloud, Tifa, and Eris. He uses his various puppets to gather important resources while otherwise being a general dick with a creepy Oedipus complex. Had an epiphany. Let's go to the promised land. Mother. While in cahoots with Shinra, he endeavors to squash and subjugate inconvenient races with strong armies and or magic and useful resources. Though near the beginning of the game the player is led to believe that President Shinra is the person with the greatest ambitions and influence, they soon discover that Sephiroth is willing to take things much further. About a quarter of the way into the plot, we learn that Sephiroth is planning to get revenge on humanity after conducting maddening research on the Cetra, as well as Shinra's various super soldier projects, during which Hojo injected many additional people with Genova's cells in order to produce freakishly strong warriors such as himself, who are capable of leveling cities. But this is merely a stepping stone on the way to his ultimate goal. It would seem that Shinra Corp and Sephiroth's interest in the Cetra of the Livestream in the Promised Land was only a piece of a much larger puzzle. Sephiroth's true interest had everything to do with the many secrets hidden within the Northern Crater and the calamitous body of Genova. After falling into the livestream during the Nibelheim incident, he learned almost everything there was to know about Genova's war against Vesetra, the planet, and the livestream, and decided he wanted to become a god. He then merges physically and spiritually with Genova, and manages to overpower its will, after which point he is able to use all the other scattered pieces of Genova's body, including those infected with the cells, as extensions of himself, on his quest to obtain the Black Materia, which would grant him the strongest known form of destructive magic. Meanwhile, he's been gathering power and knowledge within the livestream, eventually ensconcing himself within a cave in the northern crater, scheming to wound the planet so badly that he can absorb a large enough dose of the livestream into his being to become godlike. Even though Vesetra recognized that Genova's cells were a threat to their way of life and sealed it away, by utilizing Genova's power, Sephiroth continues the ancient war. At the end of FF7, the remaining Genova biomatter becomes Genova Synthesis, the final and perhaps ultimate form taken by Genova. Though not a whole lot is said about the true origin of Genova, one hypothesis that I came up with is that what Shinra called Genova initially was not a single entity but an unspecified alien mortal who had at some point merged with an extra-dimensional entity in a similar fashion to Zemus becoming Zeramis, possibly in pursuit of greater material power while losing much of itself in the process. Perhaps the merged alien had already destroyed or drained the life force of its own world and traveled to Gaia to start the process over, though this is obviously mere speculation on my part. Once the player has officially killed Genova's physical body and her host, it triggers Sephiroth's emergence from his cocoon of crystallized lifestream, and he transforms into his god form. 
It is specified in the FF7 franchise that although Genova was technically defeated, some of its cells created blockages in the lifestream which remained within the planet and could never be wholly destroyed. Kuja is a powerful warlord who spends much of the game gathering magical crystals for the purpose of warfare. He is a super soldier experiment gone horribly wrong, created in a laboratory on a neighboring planet Terra, as a weapon to be deployed against the planet Gaia. Throughout the plot, he recruits, engineers, tempts, abducts, or otherwise manipulates many personages in positions of power, influence, and technological and magical usefulness, including Queen Bran, Bran's strongest and most beloved military leader Beatrix, the engineer Sid's wife, along with Sid's finest airship, the two remaining members of the Summoner tribe, and an assemblage of demons, archdemons, and biddable monster rebels. He uses his various puppets and captives for waging war, developing battle golems, experimenting with human souls in order to create stronger, more aggressive armies, while otherwise being a general dick, with creepy, weirdly intimate dialogue. While in cahoots with Bran, he endeavors to squash and subjugate inconvenient races with strong armies and or magic and useful resources. Though near the beginning of the game, the player is led to believe that Queen Bran is the person with the greatest ambitions and influence, they soon discover that Kuja is willing to take things much further. About a third of the way into the plot, we learn that Kuja via proxy is trying to use the crystals to summon powerful primordial Eidolons capable of leveling cities, but this is merely a stepping stone on the way to its ultimate goal. It would seem that Bran and Kuja's interest in jewels and Eidolons was only a piece of a much larger puzzle. Kuja's true interest had everything to do with the many secrets hidden within the Aoife Tree, where he sought to increase his power by absorbing potent souls. However, Kuja is merely acting according to the aggressive will programmed into him by his Terran creator slash father, the geneticist Garland, who, in an attempt to save his own civilization, needs to drastically alter the cycle of souls in the core of Gaia via the parasitic Aoife Tree to make room for the sleeping, disembodied souls of his fellow Terrans. The player finds out that the Terrans once had an advanced, wondrous culture, but over time, their planet began to wither and decay, possibly due to a disruption in the cycle of souls in their own planet. The ancient Terrans endeavored to find a healthy planet with which to merge peacefully and created Garland to oversee the process while they slept in stasis. But Garland's attempts to merge the planet failed miserably, and out of desperation he resorted to violent measures. In the last vestige of the Terran world, a giant palace called Pandemonium with a tiny village at its base, Garland conducts further experiments to expedite the Terran agenda, producing genomes modeled after Kuja, designed to eventually hold the souls of his people, once he has found a way to force Gaia's core to accept the Terran souls in place of its native spiritual essences. But this is disrupted when Kuja discovers that Garland, dismissing him as a failed project, had drastically shortened his lifespan. Despairing, Kuja absorbs a vast amount of souls, kills Garland, and destroys the remnants of the Terran civilization inadvertently awakening the transcendental being Necron in the process. At the end of FF9, Necron describes itself as being the darkness of eternity, an entity who exists as something akin to a god of death and was seemingly behind it all the entire time. When the player defeats Necron, he claims that he will always exist as long as there is life and death. Seymour is a powerful warlord who spends much of the game tracking down advantageous sources of Pyroflops, the raw life force of Spira, for the purpose of warfare. His mother was human and his father was a Guado, from the magical forest nation. He was bred as a symbol of peace and forced to train as a summoner and get involved in esoteric politics from an early age, yet was perceived as monstrous by many. Throughout the plot, he murders, tempts, abducts, and otherwise manipulates many personages in positions of power, influence, and technological and magical usefulness, including his father, Yo Micah, Yevon's devoutest and most beloved religious and military leaders, the famed summoner Yuna, the protagonist, and an assemblage of biddable monster rebels. He uses his various puppets and captives for waging war, though that part is not obvious at first, while otherwise being a general dick with an unsettling soft voice. Death is a sweet slumber. All the pain of life is gently swept away. 
are. Yes. He goes along with the wishes of Yo Micah for a time, but only for as long as it aids his actual agenda. Though near the beginning of the game, the player is led to believe that Yo Micah is the person with the greatest ambitions and influence, they soon discover that Seymour is willing to take things much further. Later on in the plot, the heroes learn that Seymour is trying to merge himself with Sin, which is a massive whale-like magical armor capable of leveling cities. But this is merely a stepping stone on the way to his ultimate goal. It would seem that Micah and Seymour's interest in summoning was only a piece of a much larger puzzle. Seymour's true interest had everything to do with the many secrets hidden within the Dream Xanarkand and the Calamitous Body of Sin, both of which were constructed from Pyreflies, the life force of the dead. As it turns out, he wishes to destroy all life in order to end the suffering of humanity, suffering which ultimately exists as a result of war. Even though the citizens of Xanarkin decided to destroy their own city, recognizing that humanity had become too powerful and that war was the worst possible evil, by striving to perpetuate sin, Seymour continues the ancient war. That being said, later on, it's discovered that the political leader of Xanarkin, Yu Yevin, was the one originally responsible for creating sin, and that the insurmountable suffering which turned Seymour into a murderous madman was a direct result of Yu Yevin's cyclical attacks on Spira and the spread of his toxic religion. Yu Yevin had programmed Sin to destroy any cities that got too large and suppress any attempts at mustering technological strength, wishing to prevent further nations from growing as powerful as his past enemies. The last vestige of Yu Yevin's world is an idealized dream version of Xanarkand, which he upholds via sacrificial rituals, unwilling to accept his defeat and the destruction of his beautiful city. Near the end of FF10, it is revealed that Yu Yevin's soul has also merged with Sin, and that he dwells barely conscious within the spiritual construct, existing as something akin to a mindless death machine, absorbing many misguided souls into itself in order to maintain its existence. Seymour, unable to rid himself of his obsessions, gets his wish and also merges with this being, which eagerly devours his hateful, potent pyreflies into itself, becoming stronger and more deadly than ever before. When the player defeats the numerous end bosses, a wispy husk of Yu Yevin's soul reveals itself and claims that Sin cannot truly be defeated. In case it wasn't obvious from all those synopses, I've created a little chart that shows exactly how all the villainous archetypes interact with one another. I will elaborate on the finer details of the hierarchy later on in this video. There is the power, void, time travel, interdimensional travel, space-time manipulation, etc. Which can be awakened via the acquisition, seizure, destruction, redirection, or contamination of the crystals, life stream, pyreflies, cycle of souls or planetary core, all of which, as I've hypothesized previously, can be considered ostensibly the same thing. Let's just call all of this life force stuff the source to simplify things. By controlling the source, in whichever way suits their most prominent desires, the various villains, great and small within the series, effectively injure reality. The primary villain in each story or saga is often revealed to be someone separate from the main antagonist of the story. Or perhaps I should say, the primary instigators are revealed to be the persons who intentionally tapped into the source energy and set things in motion. The main antagonists, however, are often the ones to finish the job, though sometimes these instigators are psychically or even physically attached to the main antagonists. In the majority of cases, the main antagonists are still the end bosses, at least by appearances, and remain as such. But in every instance of this, they transform themselves into something much more hellish, often bearing a closer resemblance to Lovecraftian old gods than to their previous humanoid forms. In these cases, it is conceivable, in my opinion, that an unnamed entity, stronger and even more deadly, is pulling the strings that the mad god Kefka, Sefer Sephiroth, Seymour Omnis, Chaos, Emperor of Hell, Vain the Undying, and even Neo-Extep are mere conduits for whatever the ultimate evil really is. 
but, as I speculated in the previous episode, it's conceivable that if one climbed all the way down the twisted roots of the proverbial tree of evil, one might find its true origins formless and indecipherable. So, what is but true evil in Final Fantasy? Is it simply the nothingness at the beginning of time, which, by its nature, forces non-existence to counter-existence? Is it merely the darkness which exists to offset light? In that case, how long and how far did the fractalous FF universe zoom into itself before something inside it became self-aware? Is the existence of space and time synonymous with self-awareness? As nerdy as that final question might have sounded, the answers to the previous questions might be contained within it. Space and time are what separate the oneness of eternity into individual moments. Self-awareness could therefore be, in essence, the opposite of omnipresence. Think about it. That we are individuals is the reason we experience only one perspective at any given moment. How does this relate to Final Fantasy, you ask? Well, I know I've sort of hinted at this in two other videos already, but bear with me while I reiterate in even greater detail. In the highest and purest dimensions, space and time are virtually non-existent. Therefore, each and every event is happening all the time. That means that the Big Bang event, or the separation from oneness, is also happening right now. If one of the FF universes is some sort of fifth dimensional cloud of coordinates, try to imagine that, then the primary source of evil probably exists at the breaking point. This breaking point exists at the birth of space, before time. Thus, this would occur in the fourth dimension, often graced against by the heroes near the end of each game. Likely, they are transported to a physical manifestation of the coordinates adjacent to this destructive event. This tends to take place inside of, or nearby, geographical landmarks containing or created by the aforementioned meddlesome otherworldly instigators. In the midst of the event, a chain reaction is pulling an avatar of pure darkness toward the third dimension, where it seeks to destroy all life and disrupt the natural order. Why does it do this? Because, in a perfect universe, in which all things exist simultaneously, so must imperfection exist. Without that precious little drop, our ocean would be incomplete. Unbalance, hatred, excommunication from eternity, death. Once awakened, a god or goddess of destruction, a Ragnarok event, and a celestial tsunami of disorder. Want to know what happens once this thing wakes up? It gains a solid form as it propels toward our precious time dimension. Perhaps ambitious mortals act as antenna, giving this event the final push it needed to bring itself into existence by making it aware of itself and granting it compatible space both figuratively and literally to trickle into. And so we thank you for granting us our long the alternate switch flicks itself on and forces the universe to become binary. The Scion is no longer a drop in a Zen sea, but a free radical roaming the universe. Once this thing has gotten out of bed, Sinna's hammer hits the glass and reality rends apart in evil's wake. Gods, protective eidolons, monsters, and archdemons form amid the chaos, each shreds of the former universe, possessing varying degrees of power. Some are old, familiar entities reborn, others are lesser known to the player. It is my personal belief that the various elemental fiends were also created in this way. There is evidence to support this in the Crystal World in Nine, where Zidane's party has to fight against crystal template beings resembling not only the four fiends they encountered in Memoria, but also the ones they fought on Gaia. The fact that they sometimes respawn into other games also suggests that they are conjured avatars rather than physical beings. In fact, as I suggested in my previous video, I think most of the summons, gods and demigods, and even some of the monsters are also avatars. Their relationships to one another intricate and precise, like threads on a spider's web. If the spider web looked like this. But let's look at these monster hierarchies more closely. In the series, the Archfiends exist, without exception, to serve as the primary antagonist, regardless of whom they're answering to in its stead. Megabosses, whether they be Archfiends or sadistic Golden Boys, also tend to have their own minions, whom they call upon to do their bidding. When they are defeated, they return to the Aethers, 
only to be summoned again, sometimes in other settings, or in other forms, or in other games. The monsters might be the same way. In the physical worlds, they respawn like crazy, but not necessarily because they're breeding all the time. It might be that an intelligence, or something akin to one, is replenishing them. It's directly stated that an increase of monsters is caused by Golbess, Zandi, Garland, and many other villains. Sometimes this means that abominable creatures are emerging from the depths, and other times it means that the natural wildlife is spontaneously becoming more aggressive. Perhaps even in the games that do not state directly that the monsters are the result of a greater event, this is so. In FF10, the fiends, as they call them, are said to be hewn from the essence of discontent souls, making them similar in many ways to the mist spawn in FF9, the failed Lassie turned Seath in 13, and the Genova infected in FF7. Given that mist, pyreflies, mako energy, etc. are often byproducts of magical rituals and experiments, and are also used to conjure and construct magical devices and golems alike, it may be that the appearance of supernatural creatures is synonymous with reckless uses of magic, that by tapping into the source energy, the patterns of all these creatures are brought into reality, sometimes intentionally and other times accidentally. Of course, the origin, function, complexity, and motivation of each individual creature varies, existing as gods, summons, mythological creatures, animals, machines, phantoms, demons, living goop, and literally everything in between. Some are patently evil, summoned with malicious intent, but others, closer to the physical worlds, seem to be chaotic affectations caused by mana, life force, spirit, and planetary energies recycling and reorganizing themselves, and, like water, transforming and seeping into everything around them, living or otherwise. As I mentioned in part 3, perhaps some of our run-of-the-mill monsters are the product of real-world flora and fauna, along with whichever clans of mythical creatures naturally inhabit a given FF world, stumbling upon crystals, equipping relics, and lingering around fountains of source energy. Others could have been the experiments of ambitious wizards and scientists, abominations, having escaped from or possibly even destroyed the labs, towers, or military bases that once contained them, roam the land, terrorizing passers-by. There is much evidence of this in FF6 and 7, in which machines run rampant on the overworld. Likewise, there are magically and mechanically augmented creatures in all of the games. The conclusions I've come to are that some monsters formed accidentally, some were formed by evil deities, some were built or enhanced by humans, others were built or enhanced by magical clans. Some monsters augmented themselves, or one another. I've imagined a horde of screeching goblins, excitedly passing around crystals or materia zapping one another, lizards evolving rapidly to walk on two legs or equip shields. Experimental armed drones going haywire during beta testing and busting into the skies, and mind flayers of the deep, earning sprite recolors by using magical tomes to pump up their stats. But what's behind it all? We've explored how there are monsters, but why are there monsters? Naturally, the humanoid quest for power and wisdom is inherently just in the beginning. The Lunarians in FF4, Terrans in 9, and original worlders from 5 ultimately began their existence in a state of innocence, as did the Humes from all the various versions of Earth in the series. But somewhere in each timeline, these ancient civilizations were all in turn corrupted. So, really, the question we should be asking is, where is the corruption taking place? To answer that question, we need to take a closer look at what I've been referring to as the Scions. At the end of each game, the heroes encounter something that seems to exist on an oddly specific rung of the cosmic ladder. This thing is discernibly the boss, ranting about its highly destructive agenda. Another relevant question might be, why this thing? Why not that thing? Or this thing? I mean, look at all these. There's a lot of confusing stuff going on. If we study them more closely, we might notice that their visual appearance, hierarchical structures, and functions are similar to descriptions of angels, spirits, and daemons in various religious media, such as Hebrew texts, ancient carvings from a wide array of cultures, and primeval cave art. These angels, demons, ancient god forms, and scions alike 
also bear striking resemblance to self-transforming machine elves, which are entities and constructs experienced or hallucinated during the release of dimethyltryptamine, which is a chemical naturally occurring in our bodies, thought to be responsible for dreams, closed-eye visuals, and various other visual phenomena. Square definitely did its homework when designing the various monsters and bosses and god forms in Final Fantasy, taking inspiration from the kinds of images found in spiritual and philosophical cultures throughout the world. Whether such images are prevalent in human cultures due to experiences induced by sleep chemicals, meditation, or psychoactive drugs, or due to a deeper transcendental truth, many such spiritual images bear a striking resemblance to those encountered in or around extra-dimensional Final Fantasy environs. In a sense, we could say that the forms of many of these creatures and entities could have been designed to remind us on a fundamental level of familiar shapes and constructs within our own minds. Personally, I find this idea appropriate for endgame environments, given the likelihood that the FF villain's own psyche is at least partially responsible for the personality, aspect, shape, and color of the merged scion. The scion, the breaking point, or perhaps more aptly, branching point, is therefore inextricably linked with the villain and all the events surrounding him. Ultimately, the villain gives the scion a form, but before this, the unassigned scion, though indirectly, was partially responsible for giving everything a form. As I've stated in part 7, the rendering force, or again, more aptly, rending force, which carves the world out of unformed proverbial stone, an essential part of the creation myths in the series, is refining existence ever further, by its nature motivating kings, scientists, and creators to invent increasingly complex devices until they begin to dissect the very earth and everything on it in an endless search for deeper and more profound truths. But invariably they take this too far, and corruption ensues. The unenlightened king or queen, via the wielding of this powerful scalpel of enlightenment, desires to dissect not just physical existence, but spiritual existence and spiritual truth. One example of this would be Queen Karnak draining the fire crystal with the crystal amplifier in FF5, in spite of the evidence that this was what shattered the air and water crystals. Another example is when Yo Micah, the world's spiritual leader in FF10, enables the summoner pilgrimages despite his awareness that doing so will perpetuate the cycle of sin. In the minds of such madmen, objective truths have been ignored or heavily distorted. According to much lore embedded in the Final Fantasy series, such actions maintain the existence of evil, causing the rending force to maneuver itself via unbalanced and chaotic pathways which circumvent mystical failsafes by targeting the cruelest and most ambitious entities from demons to warmongering overlords to frail politicians to mindless soldiers. I sort of like to think of the evil existing in a given FF as a corrupting arm that reaches from reality's breaking point all the way down to the mortal realms. The freaky end bosses are likely taking whatever shape is the symbolic material equivalent of their coordinates in the higher dimensions, shrouded in objects relevant to the mortals whom, by their corrupt actions, empower it. Once initially given to will, usually by a proud and ambitious member of an advanced civilization during some ancient fray set long before the events of the game, in order to maintain its foothold in the denser dimensions, this scion works its way into the hearts of mortals, until it ultimately inspires those who are most vulnerable to its influence to breed, engineer, or psychologically program an angel of death. Of course, the creators and breeders of these warlords and super soldiers rarely comprehend the repercussions of this deed, for they're far too focused on their own selfish desires. Depending on its nature, the scion will then either merge directly with the angel of death once he's strong enough to be useful, as is the case in FF1 and 2, work primarily through a small handful of individuals, as is the case in FF4, 5, and 12, or annex a multitude of pawns or otherwise establish a magical hierarchy or assemblage, as is the case in FF13 and 7. Some of the time, by the end of the game, the scion has spread itself into two or more beings, which ultimately act as its appendages, eventuating multiple varied boss fights. Here is the villain hierarchy as it stands. The dark and light forces of the universe, which have not yet been called upon or personified, each neutral and existing merely to define and balance existence. The breaking point, at which one of these forces grew more prominent than the other, 
initializing the decline of a golden age in the material realms. The Scion, existing as a god of crushing chaos or crushing order, personified by mortal concepts of death, darkness, hatred, nihilism, etc., and usually, though not always, bearing the aspect of the Angel of Death. Some of these include Chaos, the Dark and Light Emperor, Dark Cloud, Zeramis, Neo X Death, the Mad God Kefka and his Tower of Effigies, Sefer Sephiroth and Genova Synthesis, Ultimacia's Final Form, Necron, Sin, the Undying, and Orthin, with Pulse and Lindsay as extensions of Boonifels. This game describes the technicalities of the Scion more vividly than some of the others. In most of the games, the Scion indirectly threatens to return upon being defeated, stating, ostensibly, that the fallibility of mortals is the seed or spark which keeps its will partially alive, even while it's inert. Next are the Handlers, ambitious, powerful personages from the game's past, possessed of godlike abilities and partially responsible for starting massive wars which set the chain of events in motion. Often these entities are bound to the main villain in some way. Some examples are Zemus, Enuo, the Warring Triad, Genova's humanoid form and or host, Hein from FF8, Garland from FF9, Yu Yevin, Bena from 12, and Eden from 13. Then the main villains themselves, or angels of death, each in his or her own way wishing to assume the role of a god, often reigniting old, unresolved global-scale conflicts. The angel of death's will and identity mingles with that of the scion. Sometimes they manage to escape or kill their respective handlers and free themselves by the end, but the majority of times they merge with said handler in some fashion, or otherwise play right into the scion's hand. Some examples are Garland from 1, Mateus, Zandi, Golbez, Xdeath, Kefka, Sephiroth, Ultimacia, Kuja, Seymour, Vane, and Barthandalus. Underneath this layer we have the Archfiends. These only exist in a few of the games, but enough of them to make them noteworthy. They are much stronger than most bosses and are employed by the main villains essentially as weapons. Some of the demonic mega-bosses in the series could potentially fit into this category as well. One rung down from those guys, we have the Beguiled Emperors, who believe they are running the show, but are actually pawns. Some of the time they are unquestionably evil, whilst others have been brainwashed or driven mad. Some of these are King Baron, Gestol, President Shinra, President Delling, and to an extent Edia, Queen Bran, Yomaika, Lord Gramis from Twelve, and, though he never technically existed separately from Barthandalus, Daisley is functionally a puppet emperor. Beneath this layer, in terms of authority and levels of evil, come the nightmare scientists. Sometimes these characters aren't completely evil, and in a couple of cases they're actually good people, but their inventions directly or indirectly cause wars and cataclysms alike, and they often mess around with volatile things that ought to be left alone, and in some cases, nothing at all is sacred to them. Typically, the more unscrupulous they are, the more power and leeway they're given, whereas the wholly virtuous versions of them are sometimes abducted or manipulated into creating risky technology for the villains to mess around with. Most, though not all, of the SIDs in the series fit into or otherwise overlap with this category, most notably the ones from 5, 6, and 12. Some other nightmare scientists include Luke from 4, Hojo from 7, and Dr. Odin from FF8. Next on the ladder of corruption come what I call the Tragic Knights. These guys span a wide spectrum of characters in terms of disposition, motive, and circumstance, but more often than not, they're either heavily brainwashed or otherwise misguided, often taken advantage of from an early age, looking up to the beguiled emperor characters as role models or parental figures. 
Usually, the antagonists use these angry orphans, lonely devotees, and upstart hopefuls as deadly weapons, just for as long as they remain indoctrinated. The very moment the usefulness of the tragic knight runs out, he or she is tossed cruelly aside. Many protagonists and anti-heroes alike fit into this category, the minor distinction between these being unsettlingly subtle. Ultimately, the only difference is whether or not the tragic knight is able to snap out of it. Some notable examples include Leon from 2, Cain and Cecil from 4, General Leo and Celeste from 6, the Turks from FF7, Cypher from 8, Steiner and Beatrix from 9, Wen Kinnock from FF10, the Judges from FF12, and Sid Reigns and the Bot from 13. Your Eminence, please escape. I'll cover your retreat. Why don't you leave, Jill? Or rather, take your leave. Humans have no business here. What? Your Eminence! <laughs> what? Magic? Finally, we have the run-of-the-mill super soldiers, along with lowly grunts. These are the ant-like armies we have to fight in almost every game in the series. The stronger versions are magical, cybernetic, or equipped with overpowered weapons. Aside from these guys, we really only have the monsters to deal with, and those guys follow their own set of rules, spanning from Critter to Megaboss. So there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Final Fantasy The Psychology and Philosophy. I'm not sure if I'm going to do another one, but if I do do another one, it's going to be about the evolution of the series. 